right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Mandalay Bay at the end of the day. I have more rhymes up my sleeve somewhere, but I'm Jonathan Katz. And today we're going to talk about a topic that is actually very near and dear to my heart. Um, we're going to talk about vector search and retrieval. And before we get started, I just want to remind you, this is a 400 level talk. We're going to dive really deep into this stuff. And so I'm certainly happy to, to discuss further. And I also want to uh, remark that we have a lot of content in this talk. It's probably going to take the full amount of time. I'm just going to say up front that we have two chalk talks after this. Uh, DAT 323, I believe one is on Wednesday, one is on Friday. And it's going to be a great forum for Q&A around this. But we do have a lot of content to cover, and I can't wait to get started. And the way we're going to do this is first we're going to talk about what's driving the need for vector search and retrieval in databases. And this topic is generative AI. And then we're going to look specifically at Postgres today, and Postgres is a vector store, and is the place for you to be able to perform this search and retrieval. From there, we're going to look at the open source PG vector extension, which is enabling these vector searches in Postgres, as well as some features in Amazon Aurora that help accelerate vector queries. And finally, a look ahead at the, the open source roadmap for PG vector, the best you can for an open source project. Now, to begin, what is driving this problem? And when I wrote this slide, I was actually in my in-law's house in Florida, and it had this very Floridian theme, like all sorts of decorations, like alligators and birds, and like very floral. And I thought about having a store, like let's say I have a store selling Florida tchotchkes, for lack of a better term, and you have all sorts of descriptions. I'm trying to build an app around it, and I see all these things with generative AI, and I see that there's probably some way where I can take some magic in many ways and build this interactive app where I can buy Florida tchotchkes online. But how do I build that magic? Like, what is, what is that thing like sitting in between building this interactive store? And the primary component is this is something called a foundational model. A foundational model is a type of machine learning model that's trained on vast amounts of data, typically publicly available information. I mean, think the entire internet. I mean, it's that kind of scope of information. And these models are trained over all this data. It takes a lot of computational power or GPU power, depending on how you're training it. And it takes a lot of time to build. And when you're done, you have something that you can query through you know, various interfaces and be able to get these human-like answers as part of the application. Even better, if you have existing information, you can use it to augment these foundational models. And this is, again, where a lot of the, our discussion today around vector search and retrieval will come in. Here at AWS, we make it possible to use foundational models through Amazon Bedrock, our GA service. And what's, with Amazon Bedrock, you have a choice of foundational models. You don't have to use just one. You know, there's, there's many that you can pick. And you can tie it directly to the information that's sitting within your Amazon Aurora, Amazon RDS databases, or you know, any other data store you're using. And you can have it work you know, securely within your, in your network. So within your, your own VPC, you can be accessing these foundational models. There's plenty of talks this year at reInvent about how to use Amazon Bedrock, and I strongly encourage you to attend those. Because today we're going to focus on the search and retrieval aspect, as I mentioned. And the primary technique, or one of the, one of the primary techniques for doing this is something called retrieval augmented generation. How many of you have heard of retrieval augmented generation? Cool. So we're in the, you're in the right place. And a brief overview of what it is is that, as mentioned, foundational models train on publicly available information. But you have data in your database that is most likely private that you can use to augment the response of your application. So let's go back to this, you know, our Florida tchotchke store. Let's say you know, I want to buy a blue elephant vase. If I go to a foundational model and just ask that question, it's going to say, well, I don't know how much one of these things cost. You know, I haven't trained on that data that exists in your data set. But if I have some sort of knowledge base, if I have this data within an Amazon Aurora database, for example, then I know that I have a product catalog, price information, all these things that can augment that answer. And then I know, OK, a blue elephant vase costs $20 or 1999. And that's the power of, this, of retrieval augmented generation, is that within a few steps, you're able to deliver that generative AI experience without having to necessarily you know, fine tune the models or build your own foundational model. Now, we need a common interface to be able to take the data from our database and, and uh, augment the foundational model of that information. 
And there's all sorts of data that you know, we might have in our database. You know, text data is very popular for, for these kinds of models. There's image data, video data, et cetera. So we need a mechanism to be able to communicate between you know, all the different parties within a generative AI infrastructure. And this is where this data type comes in, the vector. And to me, vectors are fascinating because you know, vectors have about 200 years of mathematical history. And yet, there's so many interesting properties about them that we're going to you know, dive into today. For the purposes of generative AI, the vector is that mathematical representation of a data, that it goes through some, you know, an embedding model, which basically takes the raw data you know, and turns it into that, into that vector. And it can be used for you know, all sorts of parts of the generative AI lifecycle, particularly similarity search, you know, which we're going to demo in the next slide. So here's the typical, here's the typical retrieval augmentation or RAG workflow. First, you have some sort of unstructured data, PDF document. What you do is you break the document up into chunks. And you know, that's part of, the, that's part of the, uh, the science and the art of retrieval augmented generation, is taking that raw data and getting into the appropriate chunks and sending off to an embedding model, such as Amazon Titan. Amazon Titan takes that data and turns it into a vector, and then you can store that vector in a database for later use. And we're, we'll cover why you want to do that, but you know, this is the first step of RAG, is getting that data, that raw data you already have, and turning it into a vector stored alongside its chunks that will ultimately be pulled into your foundational model. So the, so the second part of RAG is what your user is actually interacting with. You know, you have a user come to your website and say, hey, how much does that blue elephant face cost? So the user asks the question, it goes to the embedding model, which turns that into a vector, and then you use that vector to query against your, your data store, in this case, Amazon Aurora. You perform something called similarity search, so you find the things that are most similar to that question. And you take that question and you give the context that you want the foundational model to give for that answer. You send that to the foundational model and it gives that response that you then send back to the, to the user. And that's it, that's RAG. Simple workflow, but there's a lot of steps that do go into it. And a lot of it is working with these vectors. And for me personally, what's fascinating about vectors is that they're so simple. They have certain properties, they have a dimensionality, they have a size, there's certain restrictions around them, but they're challenging. And to me, it's you know, kind of mind blowing. I mean, first, you know, when, when working with vectors in generative AI systems, it does take time to generate these embeddings. So if you're trying to store, say, a million embeddings, you don't want, or you want to query against a million embeddings, you don't want to necessarily do that in real time. You do need to store them in some kind of database, because otherwise, you know, it's going to take too long to process every individual query. So then you store it, but you have to consider the size. So take Amazon Titan. So the, the Titan embedding model generates 1,536 dimensional embeddings, which to me still blows my mind, because when I studied machine learning back in college, like 20 dimensional embeddings was considered large, but here's like 1,500 dimensions. And you have four byte floats, so that's a six kilobyte payload. And very quickly, this gets large. We have a million embeddings you know, without any kind of additional compression or, data or reduction on it. That's almost six gigabytes of data. For a million rows, in a relational database, a million rows is nothing. A million rows, you know, we can, you know, we can store in our sleep, but like, that's a lot of data. So naturally you think, okay, well, let's compress it. Except this data is really hard to compress. You have a bunch of random floating point numbers together. There's not really any good compression strategies for that. We'll talk a little bit about quantization later, but the one thing I know about quantization is that you are, you know, it's a technique that helps to reduce the size of vectors, but you're going to lose information as you do that. Now, ultimately you need to, to uh, you know, query the vectors, and what you do is you compare two vectors to each other with something called a distance operation. And there's all different ways of doing that. But the challenge with doing these distance operations is that you have to query every single dimension in a vector. And look how long it took me to click through just to get through eight dimensions. So imagine your computer having to do that for 1,500 dimensions. And you have to do it every single time. And by the way, in your data set, you have to compare against every single vector. So from an algorithmic standpoint, that's an O n squared problem or an O n k problem. I mean, it takes a lot of time. So we need to find ways to efficiently compare them. And we can't shortcut comparing each dimension, but maybe we can shortcut comparing all the vectors within a database. And this is where this notion of proximate nearest neighbor comes in. So exact nearest neighbor is when you're, trying, you're querying for a vector amongst a whole bunch of vectors, and you want to find the most similar vectors to it. 
When you, when, you, when you do exact nearest neighbor, you have to compare every single vector that you're storing. But that can be very exhaustive. Even just a million, 1,500 dimensional vectors, that's gonna take several seconds. And we wanna be able to get fast responses for our application. Approximate nearest neighbor is a way to be able to get the most similar vectors in your data set, but not have to query all of them. And the nice thing about this is that it reduces computation time. It's gonna be faster than doing an exact nearest neighbor search. Most likely, we can get into some nuance there. But the problem is that you are not looking at every single vector in your data set. So suddenly, you need to be, uh, you need to be aware of something called recall, which is the measurement of relevancy. So for example, if I expect to get 10 vectors, if I know my exact nearest vector is supposed to be these 10, but I only return eight of the 10 expected set, that means I have a recall of 80%. What does this mean practically? It might mean nothing. You might build an approximate nearest neighbor index and everything appears to work as expected. Or it could mean everything. It could mean that you're starting to see results you don't expect in your application. And there's different ways that you can help, uh, help figure out what your, you know, how to adjust your recall. It could be something with your embedding model. It could be something with your vector index. It could be something with how you're searching the data. But this is something that you have to keep in mind when you're working with vector databases. And all these things are intention. You, you, there's a tension between storage, performance, relevancy, and cost. And based upon what you want and what's important for your application, you have to choose what matters most for you, and you need to make that investment. So you might decide, relevancy is more important for me, but so is, you know, so is the price of my storage. And I'm willing to pay more to get more compute to make sure I can get better relevancy, but it might sacrifice a little bit on performance. And you know, maybe my query goes from 100 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds, and that's not so bad, but all these things are intention, and it's what you have to consider when you decide ultimately how do you store your vector data, how do you query your vector data. And there's a few things you want to you know, ask yourself as you're designing the vector storage as part of your system. And one of them is, do I even need vector storage, right? Where does this fit into my workflow? Am I doing something like retrieve augmented generation, or am I working with a foundational model directly and I don't necessarily need to augment things? And once you understand that, once you decide, okay, I do need something to store my vectors in, how much data are you storing? That can impact you know, what kind of storage you choose. If you're storing trillions of vectors, you know, something of that scale, you might not want to have them on an EBS volume. You probably want to have them in something like S3. So once you understand the scope of how much data that you're storing, then you need to figure out where you need to invest. Is it in storage? Do you want fast storage? Or is it something small enough you want everything to fit in memory? or something where you know, performance really matters and you still want everything to fit into memory, how much are you willing to spend for that? And ultimately, you know, what, what's your relevancy threshold? And then, once you figure out those four parameters, you can figure out what are your trade-offs? And this is where you, know, th this is where you, affect, you impact your design. Is it, what kind of index do you use? How does that impact your query time? Like, what, what's your acceptable query time? That might ultimately impact the design. So this gets into Postgres itself as a vector store. And the first thing is, you know, you know why Postgres for anything? Well, Postgres, it's an open source database. It has a, a long history of development. I've been fortunate to be a part of the, the Postgres community for over a decade now. I'm actually on the core team of the Postgres project. And I've seen, you know, through these years, a lot of what's happened with Postgres is that bottom column, that it's been able to support robust enterprise workloads from a functionality standpoint, from a robustness standpoint, from a reliability standpoint. But one of the most powerful parts of Postgres is its extensibility, is the ability to add functionality to Postgres without having to fork it. And that's through something called an extension. And this is where the, the notion of being able to do vector searches in Postgres comes in. So first, why even use Postgres for vector searches? Because it's there. There are actually, there are reasons why you want to do that. For one thing, you might not need to update your existing client libraries at all. You can add vector search capabilities to your application without doing much work. I'm a recovering app developer, and that's something that always appealed to me, that I would always try out some new technology, and then, oh, well, it worked with Postgres, or it worked with something else I'm using in my stack. Cool, I'm just gonna keep building with that, because I don't have to do as much work. You might wanna keep your AIML data close to a lot of your transactional data. So for the example we had earlier, where I already have a Florida tchotchke store, well, all that data you know, in my product catalog is there. It's not a big leap to keep my, my vector embeddings, my text chunks, and all of that you know, next to it. And 
Postgres can work you know, as you know, the persistent transactional store with other vector systems as well. You know, a common pattern is you might have Postgres storing your transactional data, and it might be your permanent hub for things that are in you know, a text search database like OpenSearch. And this gives us, you know, this brings us to PG Vector. How many folks here are familiar with PG Vector? Cool. For those who are not, PG Vector is an open source extension that adds vector search and storage capabilities to Postgres. And it's a project that's been around since uh, 2021, and it rose in a rapid popularity this year for you know, a lot of the reasons being that it enabled the ability to do vector search and retrieval in Postgres. Now, fun fact, Postgres has actually supported a vector type data type since the beginning in 1985. It was actually used to help uh, speed up access control lookups within Postgres. But it was lacking some of the functionality that's needed for modern vector search, such as indexing. Peachy Vector brings two types of indexes, IVF flat and HNSW, which we'll spend a lot of time discussing today as it impacts uh, you know, how you uh, search and store your vectors. Um, and it also brings the ability to do not only exact nearest neighbor search, but that approximate nearest neighbor search that we discussed. And this is an important distinction, by the way, because of all the nearest neighbor type searches Postgres supported prior to PG Vector, they're all exact nearest neighbor search. And you talk to people using relational databases for years, it's like, yes, of course it's exact, because when I, when I run a query, I expect to get the exact results out. So working with approximate nearest neighbor searches can take like a little bit of readjusting to if you're so used to getting those exact answers that you expect. Now Postgres also acts as a metadata store. As mentioned, you can co-locate your embeddings with it. And there's a choice of distance operators. Um, the two most popular tend to be those first two listed. Um, you know, they look kind of like Star Wars TIE fighters. Uh, there's Euclidean or L2 distance, which is line of sight distance. And there's cosine distance, which is the one in the middle, which is the, you know, angular distance is the, the, the simplest way to describe it. Now, a lot of your decision for how you store your vector data will come down to your indexing methods. And we're gonna just dive right in and talk about, you know, just briefly compare IVF flat and HNSW and then do a deep dive into both. So, what are these methods? IVF flat is an inverted flat file. Uh, HNSW stands for hierarchical navigable hierarchical navigable small worlds. Say that 10 times fast. Now, what are, you know, what are these and what are the differences? I think let's do a high level overview. IVF flat is k-means based. So the idea is you have a bunch of vectors in space and you, find it, you want to find a certain number of centers and you cluster vectors around each center. Uh, for IVF flat, they call those lists. And based, what happens when you build the index is that you'll find a vector and assign it to a list. And the idea is that you're gonna look through these lists to find the vectors that are most similar to the ones that you're searching for. And don't worry, we're, we're gonna dive into depth of what that looks like. HNSW is graph-based. And the idea is that you traverse a graph until you get into, in, get into a neighborhood that's most similar to what you want. And the idea with HNSW is that you're gonna do a lot of work up front to be able to build these dense neighborhoods of vectors that when you do the search, you don't have to do as much work because you're basically finding the, the neighborhood of vectors that you're most similar to. Now, with IVF flat, you need to have your data already in your table to build the index. You can't figure out the centers unless you have data to be able to figure out the centers. Whereas HNSW is iterative. You can basically start with an empty table and start adding vectors into it, and it's gonna be able to build out that graph you know, with a high degree of relevancy. And finally, when you think about insert time, the IVF flat insert time is bounded by the number of lists. So you have 10 lists, that's roughly gonna you know, be the amount of time it takes to insert a vector. If you have 1,000 lists, you, know, you have to search 1,000 to figure out where to insert the vector. With HNSW, the insertion time is gonna increase as you add more vectors to the index. You know, kind of similar to you know, how a B-tree index works in that way. Now, before diving in, you know, the first thing you might be thinking about is like, okay, cool. How do we choose which one? So let me start with the easiest one. If you need exact answers, you want 100%, 100% recall, you don't use an index. And you might say, well, Jonathan, I'm sure I can use an index to get 100% recall. And yes, you probably can do that, but if you need to guarantee 100% recall, you don't use an index. Now, if you want fast indexing, you're gonna use IVF flat. We're gonna see that overall IVF flat is a much faster indexing method, but there's gonna be trade-offs to it in terms of what you have to do to be able to get the right recall performance ratio. Uh, 
If you want an index that's as close to set and forget as possible, HNSW tends to be this. The, the defaults of PG vectors seem to be pretty good for the use cases we've seen. Now, again, you know, I, I still give that an asterisk. As you dive into it, you know, depending on your data set and your embedding model, you might need to tweak the, the build parameters and the search parameters. But the idea is that this is going to get as close to, this is, app developers love this because there's not as much work they have to do as compared to IVF flat. And where HNSW is really shining is that you know, it's both high performance, high recall. This is, why, this is why folks have been adopting it, because they see, you know, they're basically able to manage it fairly easily and get the performance numbers that they want with the relevancy that they want. So now, let's really dive in. We're gonna talk about strategies for managing vectors with PG Vector and look at some of the best practices established to date. And there's really four areas that we wanna look at. First, how do you store the vectors? This does impact, how you store the vectors does impact how you can query them from Postgres. We'll look at strategies for both of the different indices, and we'll look at a topic that's become very popular lately, which is filtering. Filtering, you know, quite simply is the where clause. So you keep that in the back of your mind as we go through this. So first, storage. Storage matters in Postgres, because once you start dealing with large data, storage might not be as intuitive as you think. So Postgres has something called Toast. How many people are familiar with toast? I like to have toast you know, every, every day in the morning. Like, no joke, not an exaggeration. But toast is actually a novel system in Postgres to be able to deal with large data. The atomic unit of storage in Postgres is something called a page. And a page can basically store about eight kilobytes of data. Now, the astute Postgres user knows that you can recompile Postgres and get a larger page size or a smaller page size, but most installations are gonna use this eight kilobyte page. So what happens if you have something that falls off an eight kilobyte page? You need a way to store it. And again, this is something that's fairly common in Postgres. I might be storing you know, some, you know, some large you know, text data or I might store a blob in Postgres and that's gonna be larger than eight kilobytes. You need a way to be able to store that. And that's where Toast comes in. Toast can store that data out of line from your main table and effectively it's able to store it across you know, multiple pages, so to speak. And because of this, it gives an effective way of storing large data and also, it can have benefits on queries as well, because if you have a large text blob, that's something you're not querying very often, you don't, you know, you don't necessarily want to be pulling that into memory. So you know, storing it out of line is, does help improve query speed. And because of that, Postgres default, by default toast anything that's over two kilobytes. That's a tunable parameter. You can, you can uh, select that on a, on a per table basis, and I believe maybe even on a per column basis. But that, you know, that again is, you know, dis, you know, these defaults are decided, particularly for things like large, you know, large text data and blobs. So if you have a 510 dimensional vector or a four byte float vector, that's automatically going to be toasted. So the Amazon Titan embedding is, you know, you store that in Postgres, that's automatically stored out of line away from the table. Why does this matter? Well, actually, before we get to why this matter, the other thing you need to be aware of is Postgres column storage types. The first is plain. If you, set, if you set this specifically on a column to be plain, the data is stored in line with the table no matter what. So the advantage of this is that for something where your big blob is in the hot path, such as a vector similarity search, you might see some performance benefits with that. But then the, you have a limit is that you can't store more than eight kilobytes of that data, so roughly a 2,000 dimensional vector. Then there's extended, which is the default in PG vector, which is you store the data out of line and compress it. And you're probably thinking, like, wait a second, didn't you say you can't compress a vector? That's correct. And I believe in the next release of PG Vector, it's gonna move to external, which is you toast the vector, but you don't try to compress it. And there should probably be a little bit of a performance benefit, particularly on inserts uh, with that method. And finally, there's main, which is that you compress the data and store it in line. For PG Vector, the ones that you're gonna be most interested in are, well, moving forward, external and plain. And Selecting the storage type does have an impact. So let's take, a, let's take this Postgres query plan. I stored a million vectors, 128 dimensions, and I'm doing an exact nearest neighbor search, and Postgres is like, cool, I'm gonna do, a, you know, I'm gonna do you know, six parallel workers to pull it in. Okay, that makes sense, right? You know, I greatly expand the vector. You know, I'm using 1500 dimensions, and Postgres is like, okay, cool, I'm gonna use four workers. Wait a second, that's less workers. But I know that's more data. Like this is, you know, you know, at least ten times the size. Why are you planning less workers? And it's because 
because we're toasting the table, the Postgres query planner, as of right now, sees smaller, you know, sees less pages in the main table, and says like, okay, I don't need to do as much work. When in fact, we have to do more work because we have to go to the toast table to be able to first pull those pages in and then do the similarity. So the storage matters here. And we need to, you know, we need to make sure that when you're storing large vectors, particularly from these, you know, from the foundational models that are giving you, you know, large vector embeddings, you understand how the data is stored. So you can choose to use plain storage, which again, there's ultimately going to be a cap of how large you can store that you know, you know, within, within a single Postgres page. Or there's a parameter called min parallel table scan size, which if you only take away one thing from that is if you set that to a very low value, Postgres is going to spawn more parallel workers. So that's one way to have your cake and eat it too, where you can still toast those vectors but get the benefits of getting you know, more parallel workers. And here's that same query with that parameter set to one and we're getting 11 workers, which makes a lot more sense because we are pulling a lot more data into memory. With that, you know, so we're keeping that in mind, that's some guidance around storage. Now we can move into indexing. And we're gonna start with HNSW, you know, given the, given the popularity of the HNSW and how, uh, you know, really the performance results we've been seeing around it. Now, HNSW does have a few more knobs to turn in itself to be able to configure it, but it tends to be a little bit easier overall than IVF flat, which you'll see in a few slides. And a lot of the work of HNSW is done up front. It's in the index building process. And there's two parameters you need to be aware of. There's M and EF construction. M is the number of bidirectional links between vectors. And the takeaway from that is the more bidirectional links you have, the more likely you're gonna build these neighborhoods of vectors that are most similar to each other. We'll see that there's a cost to doing that in a few slides. You then have EF construction. Think of EF construction as your memory as you're building the index, that as you're visiting all these vectors in the graph, you're keeping a list of how many vectors you're most similar to. And the idea is that the bigger the list you keep, the more likely you're gonna find the most similar vectors to yourself as you build out that graph. Now, what does it look like to build an HNSW index? Let's say I have a bunch of vectors in space and I wanna index that orange one. HNSW works with layers. You go from less dense layers to more dense layers. So at the top layer, you might say find one vector you're most similar to. You transition down to the next layer, and you might build links to you know, two vectors, but you can see that the layers get more dense until you get to the bottom layer where you can maximize the number of links up into M to build that graph. And the takeaway I want you to have from this slide is that this does take a little bit of work because you basically have to look through, you know, look through a bunch of vectors as you descend down these layers and find the ones that you're most similar to and build those links and then ultimately store them. It's a little bit of a process, but we're about to see the payoff with querying. With querying, there's only one parameter you need to worry about, at least from an HNSW standpoint, and that's EF search. And again, that's similar to what we discussed before. That's your, that's your list of vectors that you're most similar to. The larger the list, the more likely you'll find vectors you're more similar to. And there's a caveat specifically with Postgres is that your limit must be um, uh, greater than or equal to EF search. So you can't have a limit of 20 and EF search of 10 because then you're only going to get 10 results back. Now, querying is very quick. Effectively, what you're doing with querying is that you're going to descend down to the bottommost layer and then find your most similar vector. So you find there's an entry point vector that no matter what, you know, that's the entry point. You go from there, you find the vector that's closest to you, and you go down to the next layer. Same process, you find the vector you're most similar to, you go down to the next layer. In this case, we're at the bottom layer, the densest layer, you know, and I want to give an example of what all the links might look like here. You find the vector you're most similar to, and you're done. And, should, and if you're familiar with database internals, this should feel a lot like going down a B tree or a similar type of indexing structure, because it is, it's a graph. And uh, relational databases tend to be very good at dealing with these kinds of structures. Now, just to recap real quick, the key to HNSW is that you're gonna pay, you're gonna do more work upfront with building the index, but the payoff is that you're gonna do less work when you're searching through the index and you're gonna get the results that are most relevant to what you're looking for. Though you might need to tweak it based upon what you're doing. 
you know, just some best practices, and you know, these are, I would say these are observed best practices. Typically, the default values work. Um, in the PGV vector project upstream, we did a lot of work to determine what the default values were, and initially we thought, you know, we were looking at m equals 16, ef construction equals 40. We decided to bump up ef construction to 64, because we did see a, a good jump in recall with not that much more effort to be able to, to get that level of recall. Now, different, you know, different, different vector databases have different implementations of HNSW. PG Vectors is actually homegrown based upon the HNSW paper, and we found because of its implementation, uh, using one of the later algorithms in the paper, we were able to get more relevant results with a lower value EF construction. So this advice doesn't necessarily apply to other systems. These are specific to, to PG Vector. Additionally, the other thing that we saw was that, um, well, one, one, one nice thing about the PG Vector implementation is that it supports concurrent inserts, or the ability to you know, insult data, insert data from you know, multiple, multiple processes, multiple, multiple threads at the same time. Um, it doesn't support parallel builds yet, though uh, foreshadowing, it's actually been committed, and it's slated for the next release, but this is a way to help accelerate uh, building your HNSW index. So here's an example uh, of how concurrent inserts impacts index build time. Uh, you know, we, you know, we kept doubling the client size, and we went from inserting uh, 1 million 128 dimensional vectors from taking an hour to taking close to a minute by doing those concurrent inserts. So the current best practice for HNSW is start from an empty table and then use concurrent inserts to be able to speed up the build. Now, the other two parameters you need to worry about or worry about, think about, when building your HNSW index are E of construction and M, because those impact relevancy. And the first guidance is before, uh, before um, increasing M or decreasing M, play with E of construction and see how it increases relevancy, because the trade-off is going to be it increases index build time. But you know, it will ultimately help push up you know, relevancy, particularly on queries that use lower EF search. The reason why we say start with EF construction before M is that as you increase M, it does impact recall. In particular, like this data set, this was the, uh, the open source gist data set. We've, we found that like, it tends to be very toxic with a lot of these approximate nearest neighbor algorithms for, you know, for whatever reason. But increasing M can certainly help with it, but look at the index build time. That's minutes, not seconds. It does take a lot more time, and even though we do end up getting much better results, you know, in terms of relevancy, you know, there, you know, there's a cost to it. So again, this is the, those, these are these trade-offs, you know, in terms of cost and timing and uh, in performance that you have to go through. So, in conclusion with HNSW, the biggest impact on your query performance and recall is going to be the index build. You do the work up front, but the payoff is ultimately for how you query it. And as you go through that, note that uh, when you're querying the data, EF search does improve recall, but it's going to impact performance. So let's get into IVF flat. So IVF flat is, you know, as, you know, as we mentioned, that's a k-means-based algorithm. And in this case, means are buckets or lists. And as you organize your vectors, you're organizing your vectors you know, by the list that they're in. Um, the trade-off is ultimately going to be you know, around how many vectors are in the bucket and the relevancy on it. And just, you know, just you know, to get started with this, you know, the first thing is, you know, let's say I have a bunch of vectors in space, I'm gonna try to use three lists. What's ultimately gonna happen is that you're gonna determine you know, the, th you know, the centers of your three lists based upon the buckets that they're in, and you're gonna build the links to them, and those are where the vectors are, that's where they're assigned. Those are the lists, we're done. The parameter that's used to query vectors in IVF flat is the IVF flat probes parameter, which is by default one. And basically it's gonna say when you run one of these similarity searches, you're going to only go to one list. Find the list that you're closest to, go in and you know, find your, in this case, your three closest vectors. Now, what's nice is that this is actually very fast as well, because if I only have to search one list and all the vectors in the list, if there's a reasonable amount, reasonable amount of vectors in it, it's gonna be very fast. But you might not necessarily see all the vectors that you're most relevant to. So look in this case, you know, if you eyeball it, it seems like that vector in that list we didn't search is actually closer to our query vector. And in fact, in this, in this example, if we set probes to two, we see that we get that vector as well. 
So probes is very important in IVA flat. You know, that's actually, that's actually the, the more important parameter because that's gonna help drive relevancy. But you see that there's gonna be a linear cost here because we basically have to search over you know, more lists and we have to search over all the vectors that are in those lists. So what are our, our general performance strategies? First, you know, probes, it, probes is gonna be the key parameter. Lists can impact it as well, because ultimately lists, uh, you know, if you have fewer vectors in your list, you're gonna do less work as you search over them. But probes are ultimately gonna determine how many lists that you go into, and that's what's gonna help increase performance. Now, what's interesting is that we've seen some issues with Postgres choosing to use the IVA flat index. Um, this is particularly acute before PG vector 043. Um, we improved the costing on that. But you might see after a certain point, Postgres should pick the index and you'll still get you know, highly relevant queries, but it, you know, it, was, you know, it suddenly would start doing a sequential scan and suddenly you'd have a query from, you know, that was like 200 milliseconds going to be like five seconds, which is a huge jump. There's a parameter Postgres called random page cost. I mean, th this goes back to the, the spinning disk days where basically trying to find a random page on disk had a heavy cost to it, so even if it was indexed, you know, you'd have to pay a penalty. If you lower random page cost, it's more likely Postgres will pick using an index over a sequential scan. So that's one way that you can help tune and you know, help Postgres to focus on you know, choosing an IVF flat scan as opposed to uh, a sequential scan. Also, keeping more of your data in memory does help speed things up. Um, and that includes your table, that includes your index, and if you're toasting your data, that actually includes the toasted values staying in memory. And shared buffers is the pr primary parameter that, that affects that. Um, on both of our and RDS, we try to set shared buffers to you know, values that are gonna be optimal for your workload. But you, know, you, should also, you should also inspect to see how much of your data is fitting to memory. Now, again, that shared buffers advice is also applies to, applies to <laughs> word database workloads in general. You know, naturally, the more workload that you have in memory, the more, uh, you know, the faster it's going to perform. Finally, specifically IVF flat, you might be loading a lot of data into, you know, temporary memory. You know, we call this working memory if you're doing a sort. If probes is very high, what might happen is that you have a sort that spills to disk, and every time you have data spilled to disk, you know, it takes effort to, you know, read that back from disk in order to, in order to uh, complete the query. So if you set work memory to a higher value, that data will stay in memory and it makes it easier to operate. But beware, you don't necessarily wanna change work memory globally to be able to, to be a larger value because what might happen is you end up running out of memory on your system and then the out of memory killer comes and, start, you know, and weird things start happening. So be careful with this one. And this is also why you know, in general, like the, the, the best practice we've been giving is to start with HNSW indexing because it is a little bit easier to tune these things. You know, I've talked to customers that have deployed IVF flat indexes into production, and you know, they're having great success with it, but a lot of it is that they have to keep in mind the different knobs that they, that they need to tune. Additionally, as you're setting up you know, IVF flat indexes, you know, how do you choose the values for how you build it? Uh, the general guidance, you know, this is coming from the PG vector repository, is that if it's you know, less than a million vectors, take your number of vectors, divide by 1,000, start with that as your number of lists. If it's over a million vectors, take the square root of the number of vectors. The other thing to keep in mind is you might need to rebuild your index as you continue to add or remove vectors, and the reason is because your centers start to skew. Remember, when we build an IVA flat index, we're taking a snapshot of all the vectors that are already in that index. Now, if you add more vectors, what's gonna happen is that what were your centers are no longer your centers, they're gonna shift. And the results you might be getting out of, uh, out of your IVF flat queries might not be what you expect. What you can do is you can rebuild. Postgres allows you to rebuild indexes concurrently, and that can help reset the sender so that way you're getting the results that you want. And finally, uh, IVF flat does support parallel builds at this time, so leverage parallelism as you do the rebuilds. And what's really cool is, you know, in terms of, a lot of this is actually you know, parallelizable in PG Vector, but we found that it was this step where we're basically pulling vectors from our table or from disk and assigning them to the centers was taking the most work. And the reason was that prior to PG Vector 050, it was doing a sequential scan. So imagine you have 10 million vectors in your table, you're building this index, 
You're scanning through all 10 million vectors sequentially, assign them to the list, and then, you know, and then boom, eventually you're done. But that takes a while. And we know Postgres supports parallel scans. You know, we just saw that you know, in the earlier example with the, you know, with the, the costing. So PG Vector 050 added the ability to do parallel scans. And with this, you know, does parallel sign into the list and ultimately goes through the process. And granted, there's other parts we can parallelize, including the k-means or um, well, ultimately parallel writes, but that's a lot more work. But even just like doing that, like we saw, you know, huge jumps in speed ups. On, the, on this data set, we saw a 2x speed up. Um, I've seen up to 4x speed ups, you know, particularly on a, 100 million vector data sets that we were storing. So if you do choose the IVF flat method, leverage parallelism, it will you know, greatly speed up your, your build times. And granted, the build times tend to not be all that bad for IVF flat, but it's always better to be faster, right? Now, this leads us into this topic of filtering. You know, we've built our index, we searched it, but not every query we run is gonna be select star from table, order by, my distance operation limit. You have this where clause. Where clause is one of my favorite clauses. I used it as an app developer all the time because I can filter down my data set. And that's key. You might not want to search over your entire database. You might want to search like a category of products, you know, the, the Florida Tchotchke products. But filtering impacts approximate nearest neighbor queries. And maybe not in the ways that you expect. The first is that Postgres, you know, Postgres sees the filter. It might be like, well, I'm not going to use the index at all because, well, this is going to return 50,000 rows and they're all toasted, so I'm going to do a sequential scan because that's going to be fast. But then suddenly, your queries are very slow. The other thing you might see is that Postgres uses an index, but you're not getting back the results that you expect. In fact, you might be getting too few results or, or, the, or what might also happen is that you don't see all the results that you want. Like, for example, the IVF flat, you might, only, you might not go to all the lists that contain your relevant results, and then suddenly you know, you're doing this post filter on the data, and you, don't, you, know, you, might, not, you might not get like the blue elephant face that you expect you know, from the Florida Tchotchkes example. So we need some techniques to, you know, I mean, I, I, the way I would put it is that, you know, first off, do I even need to do an approximate nearest neighbor search you know, when I have a filter? The answer is that it depends. How much data is being filtered down? If you have a B-tree index on that category ID column and you know, it's, everything is about 100 rows, no, you don't need it. Like 100 rows, you know, even, even with these expensive vector queries, 100 rows is nothing. You're gonna get you know, very fast queries returned. So you need to figure out how many rows does your filter need to remove? Because if you're in the 50,000 range, 100,000 range, yes, an approximate nearest neighbor search is gonna help impact it. And that's the final thing you need to ask yourself as well is, do I need the exact results when I run the filter or the approximate results? If you need exact results, make sure that your filter is indexed or your, the filter itself is indexable because that's gonna help speed up the query. If you're okay with the approximate results, we do have some techniques that can help. The first is a partial index. Postgres lets you build indexes over subsets of data. You can apply a where clause to the create index and Postgres will only index values, or only index uh, rows of that particular value. D very effective technique and can be used you know, beyond just approximate nearest neighbor searches. The next is partitioning. And this is a great technique if you have some data that, you know, well, I mean, you can partition your, your entire, if you have a natural partition key, first off, it's a very effective technique. But if you have, say, some vectors that you want to index, some that you don't, this is another thing, this is another technique you can use as well. And what happens is that in a partition, you can choose to, choose to build an index over that partition. So again, these two techniques, you know, this, this is currently what's available in Postgres. We'll talk about um, some ongoing work to uh, expand you know, what you can do in terms of filtering to make sure you can get the power of pre-filtering, eliminating rows before you do the you know, approximate nearest neighbor search. One other use case that came up is filtering with existing embeddings. I know this is like a complicated union query up there. And yes, I, I agree, this is complicated. I, in fact, I think I wrote it too. But some, something that's come is that I have a vector within my data set, and I want to search over all the other vectors around it, but exclude that vector from the search. So we need to be a little bit tricky. We need to do some work with subqueries. And in this case, the example that was presented was that there were two vectors that uh, we want to do a similarity search over, but exclude those vectors from the final results. And that, that's what led to the, you know, the, the union subquery that then gets you know, ultimately filtered over at the end. 
because this allows you to use the indexes within the, you know, within the table, but, uh, but you know, as you can see, you know, this takes a little bit of work. You know, this is not necessarily the kind of query that you want to write. Now, note for the astute observer, this might actually refer, remove too few rows. We probably should set the limit higher on each of the subqueries before the final query. So these are the techniques we have available today. And there's also some features in Amazon Aurora that can help accelerate vector searches. So briefly, Amazon Aurora is AWS's uh, you know, flagship commercial database and has all features that you expect you know, when running uh, you know, commercial workloads. The way I like to look at it from an app developer perspective is that you know, all the things that I should worry about but I don't want to worry about, you know, high availability, backups, monitoring, are all included. And there's features that you know, help, help you to continuously scale. This extends to vector workloads. You know, we recently announced uh, optimized reads for Amazon Aurora, which adds you know, several things to help uh, the, to basically leverage uh, uh, NVMe, the NVMe cache available on storage. And this works, this is available in two ways. First, we talked about queries spilling to disk. Instead of having to spill, you know, you know, spill you know, down to a lower disk layer, these queries can spill to the local, the local NVMe which is much faster when we have to read them back into main memory. The other feature that's involved with the, uh, that uh, Optimize Reads has is the NVMe layer acts as a page cache. So remember that the page is the fundamental unit for storing data in Postgres. And ultimately what happens is you might have a page in memory and something you know, causes it to get evicted. You know, there's you know, too much memory, you have to get rid of a page because something is you know, hotter or fresher. That page gets evicted, but instead of, you know, instead of having to retrieve that page from storage, it can be available in the local NVMe. So that way, when you need that page again, and it hasn't been evicted from the local NVMe, you can pull it up. Think of it in a way as extending the available memory on that instance. Next, you know, pay attention to what generation instance you're running. Uh, we've no, you know, we're gonna see that we've, you know, we've done some experiments, yeah, some experiments with the R7Gs, and you know, they, help to, you know, they provide some benefits over the R6Gs. And lastly, we talk about the importance of developer tools. And frameworks like LangChain are compatible with Amazon Aurora, you know, particularly through the PG Vector compatibility. Let's dive a little bit more into uh, you know, this tiered caching ability of uh, optimized reads. Where it really shines is when your workload exceeds memory. And in particular, not only exceeds memory, but you're throwing a lot of concurrency at it, and you basically have to shovel pages in and out of memory. So again, instead of having to you know, pull an evicted page all the way back from storage, you're able to pull it from the local NVMe cache. And in these experiments where we had workloads that greatly exceeded memory, we saw up to a 9x speed up. Now, the test we ran here was with a billion vectors, which should help answer the question, can I store a billion vectors in Postgres? Yes. And in fact, we store this in a single table. Now, normally, when I design a table, I don't put a billion vectors in a single table. I'm probably going to partition that table or store it amongst you know, a bunch of different tables. But sometimes you just, want, you, you just want to stress test things to see how well they handle it. So we ran this test. Um, we, you know, we, we targeted a higher, you know, higher level of recall. So we increased the EF search value. And then we threw a lot of concurrency at it to see how the optimized reads feature uh, worked. So we compared two instances, one with optimized reads, one without, and that's where we saw the, the 9x speed up. So the takeaway from this is that uh, you know, optimized reads does help extend the amount, effectively extends the amount of memory you have in your system and helps you to push your workload farther on the current instance that you're running. Now, in terms of looking at newer hardware, we ran, ex we ran a, you know, a similar experiment with the R7Gs versus the R6Gs. In this case, we took that HNSWE of search parameter, which is you know, effectively increasing the search radius or the amount of vectors that you store on your list, and you know, we kept gradually increasing it. What we saw with uh, the R7Gs was that as we really increased, well, first off, they were faster than the R6Gs, you know, even at a lower EF search value, but as we increased it, and every time you increase EF search, you're basically increasing the amount of uh, CPU power you need to take to increase the queries, we really, saw, we really saw the R7Gs shine you know, on the higher e, uh, EF search. So they kept getting faster and faster than the R6Gs. And this is why I say hardware selection matters. You want to make sure that you're picking hardware that's going to make the most sense for your workload. Though again, you know, this comes at the tension of cost as you look at what makes the most sense for what you're building out. So looking ahead, you know, what's coming down the pipe? Or pike, I should say. <laughs> 
Um, you know, as I, as I alluded to, with HNSW today, the way that you can most quickly build these indices is through concurrent inserts or concurrent copy commands. And actually, I'll note in Postgres 16, uh, recently released on RDS, uh, there's actually improvements to uh, concurrent copy. Uh, I'll be talking a little bit more about that at OPN 302 tomorrow. But already committed to the PG vector repository is parallel builds for HNSW. So if you already have an existing data set and you want to be able to build an HNSW index more quickly, that feature is available. The tension with that is making sure that you have enough maintenance working memory available for, for building that, because you, you, you don't really want to be swapping the data in and out of memory as much. Next, you know, we talked about filtering and the challenges around filtering. Um, there's a proposed patch for uh, enhancement to uh, index-based filtering called HQANN. The way I would describe it is that it effectively gives you a multi-column index for, P, for, uh, for HNSW. So let's say your vector is your first column, and then you can put in scalar attributes, such as like a category ID next to it, and effectively filter over those attributes. So that way, you can write that select star you know, from where query, and not have to worry about doing you know, that, you know, any like subqueries or any other complicated queries. It makes it much simpler to query the data. The support for more data types uh, already proposed, and this will allow you to index vectors of larger sizes so long as they're smaller. Um, there's been discussions around product quantization and scalar quantization. Scale quantization is effectively taking something like a, you know, a float for vector and reducing it to a you know, one byte integer vector. And the idea with that is that you're able to shrink down the size of the vector, but you might lose some information in the process, so that could impact recall. Prod quantization does that to an even greater level. It's like taking like a 120-dimensional vector, making an eight-dimensional vector. And what happens is that with that technique, you basically build out a bunch of centers that you know, are stored, you know, some kind of meta information, and then you point all the vectors you know, to those centers to be able to get your product quantization. Probably, probably like two whole talks just in those techniques right there, but that is something that is on the PG vector roadmap. And last but not least, parallel query. We found that since we added support for HNSW to PG vector, the need for parallel query is a little bit less, but we're going to probably see you know, these larger HNSW indexes get built, and then you know, we might need parallel query there. But there is a proposal for adding parallel query for IVF flat. So in conclusion, if, the, if you take away nothing else from this talk, here, here, here are three things to, to go home with. First, your primary design decision is going to be around query performance and recall. Those are always in tension no matter what method you use. You want fast queries, you're probably going to impact the relevancy of your results. And again, that's, you know, that's okay, that's, that is a healthy tension, but you have to decide what makes the most sense for your application. And again, based upon what embedding model you're using, you know, how your index is built, et cetera, you might not even need to think about it. Like Everything may just work, you get very fast queries with highly relevant results, and I hope, I hope that's true. I hope you don't have to use any of the techniques in this talk, I hope everything just works. But if not, you know, now, you have hope, now you have some best practices that will help you make these decisions. The decision that you will have to make is where do you want to invest? Is it going to be in your underlying storage? Are you, do you want to keep everything in memory? Do you want to use EBS? Do you want to, you know, do you want to keep things in S3? You know, what level of compute are you doing? Are you going to get a very large instance so that way you can maximize your concurrency for building these indices? Or can you use something smaller? Because you know, maybe your workload is you know, not too heavy and it's, you know, you know, it's fine to use a smaller instance. And then your indexing strategy. You, you have to pick what you want to, that's going to make the most sense for your workload. Again, I recommend starting with HNSW and seeing if that works for you. And finally, you do need to plan for today and tomorrow. This is a rapidly evolving space. I mean, think back to last November. I mean, we had just started talking about foundational models at that point. And now here we are like looking at you know, all these different you know, you know, vector database solutions out there, including PG Vector. PG Vector itself is rapidly innovating. Last year, honestly, barely anyone was looking at PG Vector. I'd even say myself included, and I'm personally happy I've been involved in the project. I mean, it's, it's been a lot of fun like, looking at this kind of data. But if you look at PG Vector last year and where it is today, it's able to handle much larger workloads. I mean, we're talking about you know, billion scale workloads. And it's going to continue, it's going to continue uh, you know, growing and changing. So as you make decisions about how you want to store your vector data, do plan for what you're doing today and also plan for tomorrow to make sure that the decision you make is going to grow with your workload. Now, 
there's, you know, but wait, there's more. Um, continue your journey learning about this topic. If you want to, if you want to see, you know, how do you combine, you know, how do you combine something like PG Vector with a LangChain application? Uh, there's Dat 413. That is, a, I believe, that's a live coding talk. Uh, that should be a lot of fun. If you want a higher level picture of how, you know, where, you know, vector, vectors fit in in general, as well as other general database trends, I encourage you to go to DAT uh, 2112. Uh, that's an innovation talk. And last but not least, you know, if you don't have time to, to uh, uh, ask your question today, uh, we are doing two chalk talks, not one, but two, uh, DAT 323 where really it's gonna be a Q&A session. We're gonna draw on the board, we'll talk about different architectures, but really it's your time to be able to ask questions and really dive deep into these topics. So I know this is the end of the day. I know there's, uh, there's a lot going on at the Expo Hall at the Venetian. So thank you for joining, joining me today.